not on. I blew my entry. <laughs> How many of y'all are tired of the enemy having victory in your life? Amen. How many of y'all are tired of the enemy having victory in your family? Amen. How many of y'all are tired of having the enemy having victory in our church? Amen. How many of y'all are tired of the enemy having victory in our community, Amen. in our county, in our state, in our country? Oh, listen to me this morning. We need power over the enemy. Amen? Amen. We need power over the enemy. And I'm going to talk about the believer's power over the enemy this morning. So if you grant, there's your title, man. Power over the enemy. The believer's power over the enemy. What is it? How do we get it? And what do we do with it? So let's turn our Bibles with me, if you would, this morning to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. And we've already had prayers, so I'm just going to roll with it, all right? Ephesians chapter 1. We're just going to read two verses. I come up here yesterday afternoon thinking I had a message all figured out, and I did. I, my subject didn't change, it's just the method changed. I come up here and stared at my notebook for about two hours and got nothing. Because I had this idea that I had figured out. And I tried to write it and I tore the paper out and I threw it away and I thought, Lord, what do you want me to do? And I sat there and stared for a while and I believe that the enemy tried to suppress me. But the Holy Spirit came and gave me the message that he wants me to preach today. It took a while to put it together, several hours as a matter of fact. Matter of fact, Chris came up here with the kids last night to play on the playground. I locked them out. And I said, I'm busy, man. <laughs> I was in the middle of it. I didn't lock him out. But Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. We're going to look at victory today. We're going to have victory. This is the last message I'm preaching on the subject of the adversary. Next Sunday's Easter Sunday, we're going to talk about the Advocate. Amen? Amen? It's timed out really well. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13 says, In whom you have also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In other words, he's saying after you put your faith and trust in Christ, after hearing about the gospel of His crucifixion, His burial, and His resurrection. Amen? He said, After you heard the word of your salvation, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you, the, you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest or the down payment of our inheritance until the red redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of of his glory. Now let me just say this real quickly. I don't want to I've got a lot to get to this morning. I'm not going to talk about these two verses too much. But I want you to understand what he's saying here. He said after you were saved, you received the Holy Spirit. Amen. How many of y'all know that every child of God, every believer in this building this morning has received the Holy Spirit? And God says in this passage of scripture, he said he sealed you with the spirit of promise, and it is the down payment it is, it is the earnest money, if you will, until the redemption of the purchased possession. Let me just say it like this. It is that you have received the Holy Spirit while you're here on earth until you get to heaven. Okay, that's what he's talking about. Okay, so Jesus said that I uh, go away, but I'm going to send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to you after I'm gone. And uh, so that's exactly what this passage of Scripture is saying. In other words... I'm not alone. Amen? Uh, when I get up in the morning, God gets up with me. Why? Because He lives in me. When I work tomorrow, he, I don't work alone because I, God is in me through the Holy Spirit. When I go to bed tomorrow night, I don't go to bed alone. For one thing, Bridget will be on the other side of me. Uh, but the Holy Spirit will also be in me. Amen? I don't go to bed alone. Listen, God is with us. I want you to understand. I want you to, I want you to think about what the implications of that are. You see, God is the Father. God is the Son. And God is the Holy Spirit. 
All three are fully God. Amen? They make up the Godhead. And I want you to think about that because that means that God lives in you. Think about that. Think about the power that you possess as a believer because God lives in you. God is with us. Amen? He is in us. Now then, I want you to know the enemy, the adversary, Satan, does not want us to understand the power that we possess as believers. He wants us to wander around in this world and walk through this world and stumble around in this world in defeat. He wants us to be defeated by our sin. He wants us to be defeated by our fears. He wants us to be defeated by our, our worries and our problems. And he wants us to think that we can't have victory over any of that stuff. Amen? That is the enemy's device. That is his, that is what, that is his plan for your life, is that he would keep you living in defeat. Oh, he might let a little victory slip through here and there. But I'm telling you this, as soon as you think you got a victory, he'll, he'll, he'll bring defeat into your life if you'll allow it. If you, if you allow it. I want you to understand that Satan wants you to be defeated. He wants you to live defeated. He does not want you to experience or know the power that we possess as believers. Remember, the power that we possess as, as believers... It's through the Holy Spirit that lives in us. God is in us. We have power. Amen? We have power over the enemy. Now, why is it that he wants us to live in defeat? Why does he not want us to understand the power that we possess as believers? It is the power of God because he knows this. It is the power of God in us to defeat him. Amen? It's the power of God in us to defeat Him. And not only to defeat Him, but to wreck His plans. Grant was uh, in Taekwondo class the other day. Uh, I wasn't there, but uh, we had a tournament yesterday that he participated in. But uh, Mr. Reagan, one of our instructors, uh, him and Grant were uh, sparring, practicing, and, and they were point sparring, and Grant defeated him. Uh, and I hope he watches this video. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, his boy, Maverick, went home and told his dad, he said, man, you got wrecked. <laughs> he didn't really get wrecked, I guess. But in Maverick's mind, he got wrecked. Listen, that's what Satan knows about you and I as believers. He knows that his plans are going to get wrecked. When the child of God begins to walk in the Spirit. Amen? I want you to look over with me in the book of John. Well, you don't have to turn there. I'll just talk about it, but you can go read it. John chapter 16, verse 7 through 11 tells us that Jesus told his disciples, He said, It is good for you, it is expedient for you that I leave. Because he said, if I don't leave, then the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, won't come. And he says, if I leave, I'm going to send him back. And he said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to reprove this world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And if you go on that passage of Scripture, it says that Satan is judged. I want you to understand something. What that passage of Scripture and that is talking about in John 7 through 11, verses 7 through 11, John 16, 7 through 11. What those verses are talking about is this. Let me paraphrase, let me simplify it. Jesus is saying, When I leave, I'm going to send back the Comforter, I'm going to send back the Holy Spirit. And when He comes, He's going to, He is going to change everything. Amen? And not only is he going to change everything, but he is going to wreck Satan's plans. Listen, Satan is judged. Amen? In other words, he is defeated. Stop living in defeat. Because you're not defeated. You can't be defeated by the one that is defeated. If you don't want to be. Amen? Because he's the one that is defeated. Listen, Satan wants to keep us from experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit in our daily life. 
How does He do this? He does this by getting us to quench or suppress the Spirit in our daily walk. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19. Everybody can memorize this verse. It's pretty simple. Quench not the Spirit. Amen? Don't quench it. Don't suppress it. Don't put it out. Let the Spirit reign in your life. Amen? Let it have free range in your, in your walk. Let it direct your steps. I promise you this. You let the Spirit direct your steps. It's going to take you where you ought to be. Amen? Because listen to what the Scripture says in Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Amen? He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Remember this. The Bible says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will have to fear no evil. For thou art with me through the Holy Spirit for us New Testament believers. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Listen. He says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And my cup runs over. Amen? Amen? I'm going to tell you what we need to do. We need to get our lives full of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And when I mean, you get your life full of the Holy Spirit, I'm talking about it's so full that it spills out. And it don't just transform your life, it transforms the lives of everybody around you. Amen? Now then, the devil wants us to quench the Spirit. He wants us to suppress the Spirit in our daily walk. How does he do this? Well, I just listed four things. There could probably be more, but I think these are four important things. Number one is the thing that we've heard probably all of our life. If you're a Christian, you know, all your Christian life. And that is, He keeps us out of the Word. Now, I know that's been something that's been preached on so much. Sometimes people just let it go over their head. But I want you to think about it now. He keeps you out of the Word. He keeps you too busy. And he not only keeps you out of the Word, maybe you're reading your Bible, but you ain't getting nothing out of it. You see, I want you to understand, the Spirit wants to have such, such authority in your life that when you read the Word of God, it comes alive to you. You know why some of you don't like to read your Bible? Because the Spirit ain't bringing it to life in you. Okay, you're not getting anything out of it. Because you're not in tune with the Holy Spirit, and it's not showing you what it wants to show you. I want you to know that you need to read the Scripture in the Spirit. Now we could probably talk a, a whole other message or two on how to accomplish that, but just kind of put that in your mind. He keeps us, Satan keeps us out of the Word. Remember, the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. Amen? It is a thing that God uses in your life. Hey, listen, it's used as a weapon against the enemy. No doubt about that. The most powerful weapon you have against the enemy is the Word of God. And the Spirit of God takes that Word and He drives away the enemy. Amen? But it's not only a weapon, but it's a surgical instrument that takes and, and reverse turns itself around on you and begins to dig and cut away the things in your life that needs to be cut away. Amen? You see, it is the sword of the Spirit to defeat the enemy, but it's also the, the instrument that the Spirit uses to separate us from sin. It keeps us, Satan keeps us from prayer. He keeps us out of prayer. Now, I'm going to talk about this here in just a moment, but I want to throw it in there again. Listen, the Bible tells us to pray in the Spirit. To pray in the Spirit. Listen, there's a lot of people that pray, but they don't pray in the Spirit. They mumble prayers that, that don't mean anything. You say, oh, don't say that about my prayers. Hey, listen to me. We need to pray in the Spirit. We need to pray with the authority and the power of God. Amen? You know, we think that, uh, you know, listen, i got to be careful here. But I'm telling you, and I just talk about myself. I can talk about myself without making you mad, right? Uh, so... I just know that sometimes when I pray, I'm not very sincere about it. I'm just doing it out of duty and obligation. I'm doing it because that's what you're supposed to do. And sometimes you just got to push through because you don't feel like praying and you know you got to pray. And I understand that. But I'm telling you, most people, a lot of people, my life, me, my prayer life is not powerful because I'm praying in my flesh. I'm praying in my own strength. 
I'm not praying in the Spirit, and I'm going to talk about that here in just a moment again. The third thing that suppresses the Spirit is Satan wants to keep secrets and unrepented sin in our life. I want to go back to the message that I preached last week. You know, I got uh, the Atwells up here since they're the biggest family in here and got them under one little one umbrella. Remember old Jesse got a lot of holes in his umbrella. And when he got holes in his umbrella, and that, them holes were sin, unrepented, secret, maybe sins uh, in his life. And when those holes got in his umbrella, his family started paying the cost. Amen. They started reaping the consequences. Listen, I want you to know something. Uh, you want to suppress the spirit in your life? Just have unrepented sin in your life. Have secret sin in your life. Things that you don't want nobody or God to know about. Well, I got news for you. God already knows about it. You might as well let it out. Amen? You might as well give it up. You might as well surrender. Unrepented and secret sin will quench God's Spirit. I don't know if any of you all took my advice last week, but I just want to say again, if you've got unrepented and secret sin that is involved in your family, your marriage, you ought to go home and talk to your spouse about it. Listen, Satan, Satan, he, he loves darkness. He hates the light. Amen? When sin is exposed to the light, Satan gets scared. When sin is exposed to the light, man, things start happening. Lives start changing. Things get healed. But until that happens, until it stay, when it stays in the dark, nothing gets changed. Things only get worse. Satan keeps division and bitterness in our hearts. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3 says this concerning the church. He says concerning believers. Endeavoring, in other words, you put forth effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. It is capitalized. The unity of God's Spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You want to quench the Spirit in church? You want to quench the Spirit in your family? You want to quench the Spirit in your children's lives? Just let division come in. I'm going to give you some scripture on this. It's super powerful at the close of this service. Listen, division will quench the Spirit. Amen? I was taught, we was listening, uh, I was listening to a guy talk the other day about a, a facility that they had bought, land and facility, and it was, uh, it was used as a church camp in the past. And I don't know what took place there. I don't know anything about it. But he was talking about having uh, people come down that was from the past of, you know, affiliation of this facility. And he said it's been closed for a while and it's got run down. They're trying to get things back up in order and running again. And the glory of God coming back down on that thing again. And he said, I invited all kinds of people that was past affiliation with it to come and to pray over that facility. Because obviously there may have been some kind of division that caused its demise. He said, I want to pray the spirit of division out of this place. And I thought, man, that's exactly right. You said, well, he didn't have nothing to do with that. I don't care. I've, listen, I've not preached on this, and I didn't get a chance to preach on it. Maybe I will at some point. But I'm telling you this, it ain't just Satan by himself. He has m millions of, of spirits that, that work alongside of him. You know why Satan seems omnipresent? In other words, you know why Satan seems like he's everywhere all the time? Because he's got plenty of help. He is not omnipresent. Satan's, in, and Satan's uh, uh, minions are not omnipresent, but there's many of them, and they can be in many places at one time. Now, I want you to understand something. I do believe in unclean spirits. I'm not fascinated by them. There's a fascination in our modern culture today of, of, un, of, of spirits, 
of spiritism, if you want to call it that. I'm not talking about spirit fascination. I'm talking about the real truth that there are enemies, and enemies can reside in your house. Even though you're a Christian, you can allow the enemy to have a place in your home. You can have, let the enemy have a place in, in deals like what I'm talking about, this, what this guy was talking about. Even though it's under different ownership, still that spirit of division can reside on that property. I believe that. You may think I'm a whack. I don't care. I'm telling you the truth. Listen, Satan can have a division residing, a, a spirit of division. An evil spirit of division can reside in this church. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be bold. I'm going to be a little bit bold this morning. I've, I'm just telling you this. God's gave me a new heart. And I'm somewhat excited about it. But I do believe there has been for many years a, a, a spirit of division that has taken place at time from time to time here. And I'm telling you, I'm tired of him. Amen? Amen. Yes. Now, I'm not, listen. You say, well, it ain't been bad. I, I get that. I'm not saying that. But I'm telling you this. I want unity of the Spirit of God in this place. Amen. I want unity of the Spirit of God. There's been times when I've allowed a spirit of division into my marriage. Is that right, Bridget? He doesn't belong in my house. He doesn't belong in my marriage. He doesn't belong in my children's lives. And I'm telling you this, I'm, I'm done with him. Amen. Satan keeps division and bitterness in our hearts. Listen, maybe there's division. Maybe there's past hurts, problems, people that you're bitter against. I will say this, and I, I'm going to keep on this train of thought, but I know for a fact many years ago there was great division in this church before I was ever around. Now, I'm going to tell you some Satan, that evil spirit can reside here. Is he? I don't know, but I'm going to tell you this. Before this service is over, I'm going to pray him out. Amen. Listen, he knows this. Satan knows this. When we begin to be led of the Spirit, here's what's going to happen. There's going to be a few things take place. There's going to be a lot of things take place, but I ain't got time this morning to talk about all of them, but let's talk about a few. Satan knows when we begin to be led of the Spirit, then we will begin to live in victory over the flesh. Amen? How many of y'all feel, how many of y'all are like me and feel defeated by your flesh oft times? The rest of you might as well raise your hands. <laughs> or you're just, you just don't see it or you're not being honest with yourself. But when I begin to be led by the Spirit, I will begin to have victory over the flesh. Galatians 5.16 tells me, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Amen? Amen? You want victory over that thing in your life that's holding you down? Well, you're just going to have to submit to the Spirit. You're going to have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You say, well, I thought you said I was a Christian. I had the Spirit. Hey, to have the Spirit and to be filled up with the Spirit is two different things. Amen? When you're filled with the Spirit, you'll know it because you'll start to experience victory you'll start to experience victory over the flesh. Listen, when you become filled with the Spirit, Jude 20, Jude verse 20, Jude is only one chapter, so you have to say Jude 20, tells me, let me just tell you what it is, Jude verse 20 says, to pray in the Spirit. Satan knows that when we begin, when we begin to be led by the Spirit, we'll start praying in the Spirit. In other words, when we begin to pray, the Spirit of God that is in us will start revealing things to us, saying, hey, you need to pray about this, you need to pray about that. 
And you might say, well, I don't know how to pray about that. Don't worry about that. Don't sweat it. Listen, the Bible says that he understands the infirmities of our flesh, our weaknesses as human beings. And he says, when we get to the point that we don't know how to pray, he says he'll pray for us. The Spirit will do that. Listen, we can pray in the Spirit. And here's what Satan knows. When God's children begin to pray in the Spirit, we'll start being like-minded. And we might even start praying for some of the same things and seeing things the same way and start praying for those things. And when we do that, listen, man, the power of God is about to come down. I want you to look at some passages of Scripture with me. If I ain't getting ahead of myself, let me stay down up here with my notes. Let's go to the next thing. Satan knows because it goes right along with it. It kind of flows together. Satan knows when we begin to be led of the Spirit as children of God that we will begin to be in unity as a church. Guarantee it. And when we come, listen to me, listen to what I'm about to say. So important. This is where victory lies. That when we become, that we will begin to be in unity as a church and when we come into unity... We open the kingdom of God and unleash the power of God on earth. Let's turn over to the book of Matthew chapter 16. This is a passage of scripture I've been referencing to quite a bit here of late. But I want to look at it again this morning. This is true. I'm telling you, this is true not just for church. It's true for your family. Men, I want you to understand something about your family. Dad, I want you to understand something about your family. You're their pastor. Amen? Now, right? You're the priest of your home. That's your church, if you will. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Jesus is speaking to Peter because Peter has just answered an all-important question. Who do you say that I am, Peter? Peter says, I believe that you're the son of the living God. Jesus says to Peter, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock, not Peter, but this rock, the truth, the gospel truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He came to this earth, died for our sins, that He rose from the dead and is alive forevermore. Upon this truth, this rock, Jesus says, I will build my church. Listen to what He says. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. God says, stop living in defeat. And start living in victory. Amen? Amen. Listen, uh, he says, he promises us, he says in his word, the gates of hell will not, shall not prevail against it. And I will, and this is the part that I love, And I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Speaking of the church. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Jesus is saying, Peter, if you'll stand upon the rock of the gospel truth of who I am, he says, I'll send my spirit. And he says, I will give you the keys to my kingdom and you can unlock heaven and you can pour down the power of God on earth. Amen. Let's turn over to another passage of scripture, verse chapter 18 and verse 18. He's going to say it again. Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Listen to me. There is some things maybe in your life. There may be some things in this church. There may be some things in this community, in this county that need bound up. Amen? And Jesus says, I'm going to give you the authority in my name to bind those things. 
I'm going to give you the, the authority to bind them. And if you bind them on earth, I will bind them in heaven. Boy, I'm going to tell you something. That's what we need. Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Let me say this just real quickly. I believe that there's also some people who need to be set free. And Jesus says in my name, if you set them free, I'm going I'm I'm to honor that. There may be things that need to be set free in your life that you're bound to and you need loosed. Jesus says, speak in my name. And he said, I'll loose them in heaven. I'll, I'll bring the power of all heaven down on that thing. And not only that, we need to look at it this way too. Listen, what we need to do is we need to loose the power of God on this earth. Amen? We need to loose the power of God on this church. We need to loose the power of God in our daily walk as individuals. We need to loose the power of God on our families. Amen? Let God's Spirit reign freely. I want you to look on the passage of Scripture here. Verse 19 says, And again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth, notice something here, agreement, unity. Amen? Isn't that what he's saying? Unity, agreement. That if any two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done. Of my Father which is in heaven. You see? You know why Satan wants you praying in the Spirit? You know why Satan wants us praying in the flesh? Because when we're praying in the flesh and we're looking at things in the flesh, we'll go two different directions. But when we're praying in the Spirit, we're going to come to the conclusion of the same thing. And when we do that, the power of God falls down. And when the power of God falls down, whatsoever we ask in the name of Jesus, it is done. Amen? Amen. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Now that's a little church, right? But it's a powerful one. And I'd rather have two or three together in the name of Jesus and unity of the Spirit, praying in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, than to have 300 that are living in the flesh. Because I'm going to tell you something, you get two or three gathered in His name, walking in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit, living in the Spirit, bringing the power of God down in the Spirit, it won't be long, and there will probably be 300 of them doing it. Amen? I want to give you an example of what I'm talking about, and I'm about done. I heard this example given earlier this week, and I thought it was really good because it's true. You could take seven businessmen, put them in a room around a table together with a business proposition of some sort or a problem or whatever, and we, they could all talk about it and try to hash it out, and they would probably be a few of them that might kind of agree, but you'd have seven different opinions and seven different approaches as to how to do it. And they might even leave there unresolved or angry with one another. But you can take seven children of God from seven different walks of life. You can take seven children of God with seven different personalities. Or whatever you want to say, that are led of the Spirit, key word, that are led of the Spirit, put them in a room together, bring a situation before them, and I'm going to tell you something, they're all led of the Spirit. I promise you, I promise you, they will all come to the same conclusion. Now that doesn't happen in the flesh. That only happens in the Spirit. You say, oh, that can't be. No, it can be. It must be. If we're going to see the power of God come down this way, it's got to be. Amen? Listen, seven Christians, ten Christians, 700 Christians, I don't care. Uh, you put them all together walking in the Spirit, and they're going to get like-minded. 
You say, I don't know about that. Let me tell you something. On the day of Pentecost, they were all praying with one accord in one place. And when they prayed with unity of spirit in one accord in one place, the Holy Spirit filled that room as a mighty rushing wind. And the world has never been the same since. I believe you can still do it. Amen? But we have got to be led of the Spirit. A body of believers that are not completely surrendered and led of the Spirit will... I guarantee you, I promise you, will suffer division. Because you will have some spirit-led people, and then you're going to have some flesh-led people. Maybe they're all children of God. I ain't saying that. I'm telling you, there is plenty of worldly Christians. And I'm not talking about worldly because they're living in sin. I'm talking about Christians that ain't filled with the Spirit. And these people are going to be in division against each other because the Spirit's going to lead one way and flesh is going to lead the other. I want you to understand something about the flesh. When you're led by the flesh, you're opening the door for Satan to come in and have his will done. Body of believers, again, that are not completely led to the Spirit will encounter division. A family that is not completely led to the Spirit will encounter division. Parents and children that are not completely led to the Spirit will encounter division. Amen? Whew. You know why Grant can sit up here and say, Praise the Lord and amen me? Not because he's such a good boy and my son, although he is. But because he's filled with the Spirit and so am I. And me and Grant together, Father and Son, can be in unity of mind and spirit. That's where I want your children to get. Julie ain't amen to me, so I don't know about her. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I want you to listen. John chapter 14 and verse 12. Jesus says... When I leave, and I'm paraphrasing here, I'm not turning it over there, I want you to listen. John chapter 14 and verse 12, Jesus says, Hey, when I go, you're going to do greater works than these. I want you to think about that. Go read the Scripture. Jesus said that we, as believers, are going to do greater works than He did. Not my words. Those are His words. Amen? That's power. That's power. Because you see Jesus win and he died and he defeated sin. He defeated Satan. He defeated all the wrong. And now we have the Spirit of God living in us. It is a powerful thing. You know why we don't see the wonder-working power of God? You know why we don't see miraculous things happen? You know why we don't see people's lives transformed? One simple answer. As believers. Because we have not emptied and died to ourselves. You got to empty yourself. You got to get all that junk out. How do you do that? By surrendering to Christ. Amen. By confessing your sin and your stuff and all that junk in your life, just saying, Jesus, here I am. I'm nobody. I'm dying to myself. I'm emptying myself out. Listen, you need to empty yourself out and die to yourself and then be filled with the Spirit. And when we do that, and only when we do that, will we see transformation in ourselves. You want your life to change? You want things to be different? Die to yourself. And let the Holy Spirit take over. Amen? You want things to change? Empty yourself out. And let the Holy Spirit fill you up. Then we will see transformation. Not only in ourselves, but we'll see transformation 
in our family. Some of you all, Beth, I won't talk about you, but she was telling me some awesome stuff a while ago. Listen, we are never going to experience victory in our families until we surrender it completely to Christ. Ourselves, our children, our situations, whatever it is, Jesus, I can't do this. You're going to have to lead. Whatever it is. Listen, then we will see transformation take place in our families. Then and only then will we see transformation take place in our church. And then and only then will we see transformation take place in the lives of others. And that's what we're here about. I ain't here to play games. I ain't here to sound good. I can't even stand to listen to myself, by the way. I will not watch it. So I ain't here for any of that. What we're here for is to experience the life-changing power of God. Amen. I'm telling you, He's got it. He can do it. Amen. He can. I'm going to ask you all to stand with me, please, this morning. I'm